We were sitting around one Saturday night, nothing to do all night to do it, when someone suggested, let's play spin the bottle. We were young marrieds at the time, uh, so we had to tweak the rules a little bit from what I remember of the game when I was a kid. Back in the day, you'd spin the bottle, and um, if it pointed at you, the girl then had an option. She could either give you a quick kiss on the cheek or just pay you a nickel. So by the time I was in fifth grade, I owned my own house uh, <laughs> that I purchased with nickels. Uh, but on this night, uh, we were grown-ups, and so we decided, okay, we'll ask a leading question, spin the bottle. Whoever it points to has to answer the question honestly. So I thought it would be fun if we could play a few rounds together in church. Are you game? Now, this is only fun if everybody plays honestly. So I have a list here, some of the very questions that we asked that night. I'll ask you, just raise your hand if this applies to you, okay? You excited about this? First question we asked, have you ever told a lie? Like, have you ever been downloading software and you get to that page with the empty box that you're supposed to check saying, I have read all? <laughs> the terms and, and you check the box, that was probably a lie. I need to see your hand. Okay, all the liars in God's house. And, okay, I, I'll keep score here. I, I think that's 100%. Uh, everybody except two in the balcony up here. And I know they're lying, so. <laughs> Have you ever cheated in school? Maybe on your income tax this week. Anybody? Too soon? Have you ever stolen anything? Like at 7-Eleven, you fill the big gulp, take a few sips, and then you refill it without paying for the soda you just stole? Any thieves? All right, very good. I'll give you about an 80% there. Have you ever cursed, said a bad word? All right, now I know a lot of you are Dallas Cowboy fans, so I know you have cursed. Have you ever had an impure, a, a wayward sexual thought? Anybody? You don't have to raise your hand. Just, just, <laughs> just wink at me. <laughs> but thank you back here for your honesty. <laughs> now, I'm guessing half of us are guys, so I know it's at least 50%. Uh, that's quite a list. You did well. <laughs> Well, the Bible is clear that we all have our lists, and the wages of sin is death. That's the bad news. The good news is when we present our list to God, He is always faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. That's the gospel. That's the good news. That's the theme of this current pulpit series. We're diving in together to understand, explore the, the character of God, the gospel. God always. God never. God sometimes next week. Now, really, this series is a response to our responses collectively in our last series. Pastor Randy did something that he very rarely does, and that is called an audible and decided to do this sermon series in the sermonic calendar this year, this month, rather than what he had originally planned in response to how often certain questions and themes came up. Now, I was sitting with you in the pew, and I have to tell you, it was a profound, very impactful experience to read all of our questions and responses after the sermons. And I'll tell you the predominant thought that just overwhelmed me in those moments 
is not just me. <laughs> I'm not the only one who struggles with feeling secure about my salvation. It's not just me who wonders if God gets tired of me confessing the same old sin. I'm not alone coming into a beautiful worship space like this and just feeling this overwhelming sense of shame sometimes and guilt and regret and lament. We all have our lists. And so in response to this, we go back to 1 John. Last week, clearly established that if anyone confesses their sin before the Father, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then reading on, John goes on to say, if we claim we have not sinned, we make God out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. And now, we just continue the next six verses. And so that's the roadmap ahead here. Uh, all we have time for is just to work our way slowly through the next passage. So if you don't like this sermon outline, complain to the Apostle John because it's his outline. And so he continues. He writes, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. So clearly, that's the ideal that you will not sin. But John quickly pivots from the ideal to the real <laughs> because we have all sinned. And so he makes an allowance for this, and he says, but if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Or in the old NIV, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense. In other words, when we fall, God will never abandon us, but rather he comes to be an advocate for us. He does not desert us. He never deserts us. But rather, he races to our rescue to defend us. Oh, we shall often have to bow down, says Ellen White, and weep at the feet of Jesus because of our shortcomings and mistakes. But... We are not to be discouraged. Even if we are overcome by the enemy, we are not cast off, not forsaken, and rejected by God. Don't be discouraged, the pen of inspiration tells us. Even when you are overwhelmed by the enemy, you are not forsaken or forgotten, or rejected by God. In spite of all your lying, cheating, stealing, lustful, cursing ways, you are not forsaken by God. Now, I understand this in a very limited way, I'm sure, just being a dad. I remember when our firstborn, Lindsay, was born... <laughs> I could not stop just marveling at this miracle, this child. She was, she was the first really, truly beautiful baby I had ever seen. <laughs> and well, after about a week, my wife, Cherie, kicked me out of the crib and suggested that I get back to work. So we struck a deal. I said, I'll go back to the office if you'll let me take Lindsay with me. You can stay home and take a nap. It was a win-win. So I took Lindsay to the office that very first day. I set her on my desk, turned around to make some phone calls. When I glanced back, she had been raptured, <laughs> which was unnerving because I don't even believe in that theology. And then I glanced around the corner of the desk and noticed that she had fallen. Exactly. 
I <laughs> panicked. I called 911. I called a, a pediatrician friend of mine. I called everybody I could think of, well, except Sheree. Uh, <laughs> I figured I'd let her hear this story when we're all in a safe place like church. <laughs> Uh, and they all assured me, no, kids at that age are very resilient and just look for these trouble signs, but it's probably going to be okay, and it, it's okay. But I, I, there was that split second where there was just silence. And I thought at first, well, maybe she didn't notice. <laughs> and then she lets out this shriek that just made my fingernails sweat. I, it... I raced to her rescue and scooped her up. Now, what would you think of me if I reported the next thing I did was to give her a spanking and scold her, saying, Lindsay, I told you, stay on the desk. Don't fall. You disobeyed Daddy. Shame on you. Now, as punishment, you're grounded. You can never date a boy until you're 50, <laughs> which actually would have been a good punishment back in the day, I thought. I can't even imagine a dad so demonic. That never crossed my mind. Of course not. The only thing that I could think about was racing to her rescue, scooping her up, holding her close until her hurt found healing in my embrace. And yet how many of us have this wildly distorted picture of God. Every time we fall, every time you fail and mess up, he's hovering over you with the switch, ready to punish you. No, no, a million no's. That's not the heart of the Father. Rather, he races to your rescue and he just wants to hold you in his big, mighty arms until your shame, your guilt, and your hurt and your pain finds healing in his presence. When you fall, God will always race to your rescue. He will never desert you, for he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, John says. That word, atoning. Uh, in the Greek, uh, it suggests this exchange, his osmos. It's, oh, it's only in the New Testament, two different places, here in chapter 2 and then over in chapter 4 of First John. And as suggested by the context, it, it uh, says this exchange, my sin for his sacrifice. In other words, I get what he deserves, and he takes upon himself the punishment that I deserve. This atonement, my favorite way to illustrate this, remembers the days when the pastor would get in church and invite everybody to a church picnic the next day. Uh, he says, bring a sack lunch, and we'll just have a good time. And so last minute, next day, you decide, yeah, maybe I will go to that picnic. And so you go to the refrigerator and find a couple of tired pieces of bread, a rusty head of lettuce, just enough mayo to scrape up your knuckles going after it, and then some long-ago expired, very smelly bologna. And you throw together the sandwich, you're off to do the fun things we do at church picnics. The three-legged race, egg toss, so on, and pastor calls everybody together, offers a blessing, and you walk off to the shadows in the park with your sack lunch. You sit down on this rickety picnic table, pull that sandwich out. It does not look very appetizing. Smells even less so. You're just getting ready to bite into it when out of the corner of your eye, you spot something that looks like a living Norman Rockwell painting. A little grandma. White bun on the back of her head, walking toward your picnic table, hauling a picnic basket the size of a Volkswagen bug. And sure enough, comes to your table 
unfolds a red and white checkered tablecloth right up next to your elbow and starts to pull from her basket blackberry pie and blueberry cobbler and hot dog sandwiches, potato chips, potato salad, oranges, apples, banana. It is a feast that defies the senses. And there you sit holding your bologna sandwich. When Grandma glances your direction and says, hey, what do you say we just throw it all together? I got plenty of pie and cobbler and sandwiches. And besides, I just love bologna sandwiches. And so you came as a pauper, but you eat like a princess or a prince. So there you sit on your rickety picnic table of your life, clutching all your bologna. You've got a list that runs longer than the I-10. And God comes to your table, unfolds a white linen tablecloth right up next to your elbow, and glances down at you and says, hey, what do you say we just throw it all together? I have more forgiveness than you will ever be able to use up in one lifetime. You will never sin beyond the boundaries of my grace. And even though you deserve to be treated as a pauper, you are treated instead as a cherished child of the Heavenly Father. And there is this exchange, my guilt for His grace my failures for his forgiveness, my sin for his righteousness. He is our atoning sacrifice for sins, John says, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. John here is borrowing language from his gospel probably the most definitive, concise statement of the gospel in all of Scripture, John 3.16. He uses the same word. For God so loved the whole world, the cosmos, that he sent his one and only Son so that whoever believes in him will not perish but will have everlasting life. It's such a clear articulation of the gospel and of assurance of salvation. You believe in Jesus, you will have life eternal. So why do we struggle with this so much? And I think especially Seventh-day Adventists. A study out of Andrews University just a few years ago suggested that Roughly a third of Adventists worldwide have no assurance of salvation. I've seen other studies put that number as high as 50, even 60 percent. We could quibble about the numbers. I don't know exactly. But we don't need to. We need look no further back than the last sermon series where this theme came up time and time again in our responses. What question did you have for God when you entered the sanctuary this morning? And we saw it scrolling over and over. Variations of the same question. Will I ever be good enough? Can I really have assurance when it comes to my salvation? So why do we struggle so much? Well, maybe because of what John talks about next right here. Because here he begins to address obedience and keeping the commandments of God. He goes on to write, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. Here's the problem. We are constantly deciding whether or not we're saved or lost based on our behavior. So I want to make a couple of 
provocative statements that you may or may not agree with. But let me try. Statement number one. Our behavior and our good deeds have nothing to do with causing or earning our salvation. Are you okay with that? All of our good deeds have nothing whatsoever to do with causing or earning our right standing with God. Are we okay? Second statement. See where this one lands for you. Because if, in fact, that is true, then would the corollary of that not be true as well? Here's the statement. Our bad deeds, therefore, have nothing to do with causing us to be lost. Here's the truth. We are saved or we are lost, totally based on the presence or absence of a vital relationship with Jesus Christ, our atoning sacrifice for our sin. As Maury Venden put it, the great experience of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ alone is the only thing that produces good works. But good works have nothing to do with causing our salvation. We do not change our lives in order to come to Christ. We come to Christ just as we are. He changes our lives. Yes, good works is important. Sanctification, obedience, victory in Christ, all of these things are so important. But... We can't do it ourselves. John goes on. If anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know that we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Did you notice the tense there? That love for God is made complete. Complete. The key to spiritual life, then, is to live in the passive voice. And I think about the verse we looked at last week. If anyone confesses their sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us or cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. It's not us purifying ourselves. He is faithful to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is a major theme through all of John's writings. This is central to his theology. In the gospel, John chapter 15, my favorite chapter in the whole Bible, where Jesus says, abide in me, I will abide in you. And if you abide in me, you will bear much fruit. Right? It doesn't say you will produce a lot of fruit, the fruit of the Spirit, joy, love, peace, and by trying really hard, by mustering up enough willpower. No, 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 no. You, you bear the fruit, the reality of the Spirit living in you. He is the one who changes you. Apart from me, John goes on to say, you can do what? Nothing. We think about the revelation of Jesus Christ. Chapter 3, verse 20, where John writes Jesus to offer this invitation. Behold, I stand at the door. And knock. And if you just open the door, see, this is the heart of our Father. I just want to come in with you. And I just want to eat with you and be with you. The text does not say, if you open the door, I will come in and inspect what you're eating for supper and it better be vegan. <laughs> Doesn't say that. Because Christ craves connection, not just compliance. 
and external behavior. I'll share my favorite quote on this, dating way back, written by W.W. Prescott in a little booklet about 100 years old. He was the first president of Walla Walla University. He writes, for a long time I tried to obtain victory over sin and I failed. I have since discovered the reason. Instead of doing the part which God expects me to do and which I can do and which he cannot do for me, I kept trying to do God's part which he does not expect me to do and which I cannot do and which he has promised to do for me. Did you get that? I had to read it through a few times. But he had me right at the start when he said, I kept trying to be victorious. I kept trying to do good and I just kept failing. But now I'm beginning to understand why. Because I kept obsessing and trying to do what I can't do, and that only God can do for me, which is what? Sanctification, good works, producing the fruit of the Spirit. I kept trying to do that, and I just kept failing. Instead of doing the one and only thing that I can do that God cannot do for me, which is what? Surrender. To live in that posture of being yielded moment by moment. Say, God, abide in me, and I will abide in you. When I first read that quote, I wrote in my journal this reflection, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. I've been trying harder to be a new creation than I have been trying to be in Christ. Don't fight sin. Find Christ. So long as you know Jesus, you can know that you are saved. You can live in the joy and the peace of that assurance of salvation. So I want to give you just a quick homework assignment for the week, okay? So um, just start every day reading this brief passage that John puts at the end of his first epistle. And whatever works for you, we're going to put it up here on the screen, and we're all going to read it together. Now, if it's easiest, just take a picture of the screen. And then first thing in the morning when you grab your phone to turn off the alarm, just pull up that picture and read through this text, okay? Just let it seep in deep into your soul and start your day so that this kind of becomes becomes the soundtrack of your day and your week and your life, okay? To just live in this assurance. Uh, Or if it works better for you, whatever you want to do, uh, what I have been doing the last few days is just starting my day by uh, opening my Bible app and then reading these three verses uh, out loud from a different translation. So uh, today I read from the NTE, the New Testament for everyone. Uh, so whatever you want to do, but just try it this week and let Let this truth soak in. So, can we read it all together? All right, now I'm going to need you to shout it out loud because first service here, uh, I couldn't hear them. They were, but but I know you're going to do much better than first service, right? Okay, here we go. Let's all read together. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life, so that you may know, so that you may know.
Make these verses the lyrics of your life to where life becomes this joyous dance with the Spirit of God, with just a security and assurance of his love and his salvation that he will never desert you. You can live with this blessed assurance. Uh, Fanny Crosby uh, was blinded at the age of six weeks. She lived to be 95 years old and wrote over 8,000 hymns. She loved telling the story behind one of her hymns. The day that a friend of hers, Phoebe Knapp, came by, uh, unexpected, uninvited, but of course, Fanny was thrilled to see her. And Phoebe said, I, I just had this, this song, this melody racing through my head, and I can't shake it, but I just have no words. I have no lyrics for it. Could you help me? And Fanny knelt to her knees, and she spent some time in prayer, holding her little Bible up against her chest, and then finally, she stood from prayer, and she said, oh, okay, let me hear the melody. And it was an amazing miracle. Because she would say later, God just, just gave me the lyrics. She wrote this hymn in less than five minutes, sang all of the verses, all of the lyrics, unimpeded. She just stood. And as soon, the first time she ever heard the melody, she started singing, Blessed Assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This can be the soundtrack of your life. Why? Because God always forgives confessed sin, and God will never desert you, and God will change you if you live in his presence. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long in the name of Jesus. Amen.